This podcast is intended for educational purposes only. Please visit Natural Care Midwifery and our podcast page for our full disclosure. Well, welcome back to More About Birth. We're really excited to have the second half with some special guests with great stories. So Shannon, introduce your guests. I would love to. I'm so excited. We have the privilege of continuing our podcasting with Dr. Mandal and his wife, Eloise. And when we met with them before, with the first podcast, we heard awesome stories about their history, their backgrounds, some things they've been involved in. And with this podcast, we'd like to kind of pick your brain a little bit about kind of the medical side of things and some of the exciting, maybe even bizarre situations you've encountered with Pregnancy, birth, postpartum, newborns. Um, so, Angie, what do you what do you want to start with? Um, well, just any birth stories, tips, some of the crazy things that have happened. Um, and also, I want to hear a little bit about what it was like. Um, I don't know the political climate or just what it was like being an MD and doing out of hospital births because that's pretty rare. <laughs> I'm sure it was, you know, even maybe even more rare today than it was then, but yeah. I think even then it was probably not the norm. So just what that was like navigating that. Well, after we went to Minnesota, I uh, came to a town of called Bertha, 512 population. <laughs> All right. A 16 Thank bed you. hospital. And I was the only active staff at the hospital. What? So <laughs> I had my own hospital. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. And, uh, which means I was on call, of course, 24-7. Yeah. And that's just the way life went. Mm. And I, I actually enjoyed it. Um, one time the hospital staff uh, came to me and says, we, we want you to be the hospital administrator. I says, no, I'm sorry. That's where I draw the line. I said, I'm a doctor. I said, I'm, I'm already the doctor, medicine. the nurse, <laughs> <laughs> admin. <laughs> but anyway, they did find an administrator that worked well. So uh, it was uh, just an enjoyable experience all the way around. This area had a lot of... Um, Old Order Amish mm. folk around. In fact, our next door neighbors were Old Order Amish. And uh, they were pretty well accustomed to uh, um, home deliveries mm. as far as that's concerned. So that was where a lot of the population of that came from. They were very simple in their lifestyle. For those that don't know, they don't use motorized vehicles. They don't have right. electricity in their homes. Mm-hmm. No uh, telephones. No. So it's all very, and of course, this is long before the era of cell phones too, but it was a very simplistic life. Most of them walk a lot and they stay in good physical shape. So yeah. that makes their deliveries usually go pretty well. Mm. So, uh, in fact, one of the classics was uh, a lady who uh, sent out a message uh, telling me she was in labor and she wanted me to come to the house for the delivery. So I prepared my little satchel of, I had two medical bags. One was just the delivery equipment and so forth. So I prepared that, went out to the house, got there and walked into the room. And she says, well, you tell me when you're ready. <laughs> Uh, I put on my gloves and I uh, put a little sterile drape underneath her in the bed and uh, said, okay, I'm ready. And she gave one push. No. <laughs> and out popped a full-term baby, probably seven and a half pounds, whatever. <laughs> wow. Breach. Oh. And just wow. one push and here was this breech baby we in my hands. We know you're ready. <laughs> so you only had two bags. We carry half the house with us. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. We'll have to find out sometime what you carried in those bags. <laughs> right. Not lots, but uh, anyway, I did have a little Doppler so I could listen mm-hmm. to heart tones. And, and I had, of course, for my prenatals, I did a, use calipers. I measured calipers and, and tape both ways always to see how much growth there had been for the right, uterine right. size. And uh, I could pretty well, you know, I assess the uh, gestational age that way. Uh-huh. I... Uh, only used ultrasound, I think, once or twice in that five in years. In all the years. years. Yeah. Wow. And never missed recognizing twins when they were present. So uh, it was it was an enjoyable time. Sometimes I think um, in our modern age, we've lost that skill of like touching and palpating mm-hmm. and estimating gestational age and just kind of telling what's going on in mom's body by what she tells us and by what right. we see because we're so reliant on modern technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it yeah. gets to be over relied upon yeah, nowadays, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 I bet you have lots of fun stories. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So do tell. Okay. There's <laughs> another one. We had one of those Amish expecting twins, Primate. 
Well, he didn't like to deliver prime mip in the house. He Which is just, a first time mama, if you don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I should have said that. Medical speak. <laughs> yeah. She never had a baby before. Well, it was going to be twins, and he wanted to deliver in the hospital. Oh, no, no. She wanted home. No, no, no. So, you know, they have to have send somebody to a neighbor's to call on the phone. Yeah. So early one morning, husband calls. She's in labor. And John goes out with his car to the house. And he wanted to take her to the hospital in his car because they don't have a car. Mm -hmm. Well, she didn't want to go. Didn't want to go. And I thought, she's over there. He's over there trying to talk this woman into going to the hospital. <laughs> and there's no phone to tell the hospital she's on the right. way. You know, I think I should call the hospital and tell them she might come. <laughs> later, the head nurse said, I'm so glad you called. Ten minutes later, she pops up having twins. And I'm glad we had ten minutes warning. Oh. <laughs> wow. And all went, made it. all went well. Another time we got a call from Amish uh, having a baby. And it was 26 below zero that night. And, of course, snow all over everything. And John wasn't feeling good that night. Wow. So we head out in our little orange sob <laughs> and ran into a snowbank. Oh, oh, no. Slid. Like stuck? And we always had a shovel with us, except that night. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Took it out of myself, got to put it back in. So we had a friend with us that was temporary help for a few months living with us. And John wasn't feeling good. So the two of us got out with our hands and dug that little car out. Oh my. And we got there in time for the birth. With ice cold hands. Yeah. We had gloves. We had gloves. I don't remember that. We were kind of panicked. But, you know, the, the rural medicine is a little different yeah. going into those homes. Right. And then you didn't know what could happen in the hospital. One time, even then, you know, and, uh, mm -hmm. we had a prime at 19. And her husband was there with her. She had not had a class. So I was labor coaching her all through. And mm -hmm. so the labor went, as long as I stay with her, it went well. Well, the baby was born just fine. And the placenta came. And with it, a basin full of blood. Uh-oh. Don't expect that on a prime mip. It's just the nurse and I and... John and the husband standing there who didn't have any medical training. Good thing. So he wasn't worried. So I took the blood pressure just like it was normal. And I calmly said to the doctor, blood pressure 70 over 30. Uh-oh. <laughs> and yes. husband didn't mean a thing to him, yeah, fortunately. Right. So he wasn't panicked. And my husband ripped off his gloves so fast. He said to the nurse, hand me the IV equipment. He knew he didn't have much time. Goodness. And we had to give her eventually a transfusion, but we pulled her through. She had a little problems initially, but she came through okay. The husband later said he thought that was our routine. You know, he didn't know wow. there had been any I emergency. I see that a lot after the fact. You talk about it, and yeah, nobody else him. in the room had a clue that anything was wrong. As long as you don't have. Right. No, <laughs> and, and you don't want to let the people know there's a problem. You don't want right. any panic in yep, the room. You have to just smile and... <laughs> Keep but that's working. what I've learned about deliveries. You don't know what can happen. Going in the yeah. snow bank or a basin full of blood, you don't right. know what will happen. Right. So in a rural community, did you have times where you did have to call an ambulance when you were doing a home birth? <laughs> Is there a, a story you or can think of? was not an ambulance? <laughs> yeah, did you not where have would the that? ambulance go? You know. Right, uh, right. And no. where would they take them? Yeah, this is... Well, there was another doctor, sole practice himself, uh, mm. Dr. Brown, down about 25 miles away, and he had his own hospital. Uh, so I could, if I ne needed, uh, refer someone down there. One time, I don't know if it was that particular incident or whatever, I, I picked up the phone and called him uh -huh. just to get some, you know, information and yeah. back up and see what can. He says, "You got a baby, you just got to deliver it. You catch it, you do what you got to do. You know, <laughs> keep on doing what you're doing. Too late wow. to do anything else." So that's the way it was, but. I always like to keep things simple and natural. I didn't use fetal monitors. I didn't want them. I, I didn't use uh, IV routinely, only mm -hmm. when we need it like that. You sound because, like a midwife. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, because the woman's a lot more comfortable without all the yeah. needles and straps and everything else. And I think it really hampers good labor when, mm -hmm. when she's got all these other pain-producing mm. yeah. devices. Mm. Yeah. So in however many years of deliveries in Minnesota and, and working in that you know, under those conditions. So was there not one C-section in all that time? Oh, yes. I'll tell this part. <laughs> <laughs> there definitely were C-sections. He had maybe a 5% rate, you'd say? I had a, actually a 
two and a half percent C-section. Two and a half percent rate. But Way you to did, go. But you didn't know when you were going to have a C-section. Mm -hmm. Right. But he had a range for, you know, it wasn't just babies he did. He did all the emergencies, farm accidents, surgeries. We did surgeries there in the hospital, uh, appendectomies and different other surgeries. Yeah. So he had a surgeon come in from 80 miles away from another hospital, and he brought his own anesthetist with him. And our surgeries were scheduled for Wednesday morning. So don't have a C-section any other day than Wednesday, right? Yes. But we didn't know when we'd have a C-section right. because they weren't planned. But without fail, every time we found we had to do a C-section, they came in on labor and Wednesday morning and we did them That first. was a God thing. That wow. was a God <laughs> thing. And God takes care of the people, doesn't That's he? That's so cool. When, you're, when he, John's a praying doctor and... He prayed for his patients and it all went well. The other thing, if we had a problem like a preemie coming, Minneapolis, which was three hours away, they'd set up an ambulance with a staff, mm -hmm. a, a, a NICU ambulance. And you knew the, the what labor and it would be born early and they would take it back with a whole team. And one time we had twins that were early and they sent two NICU ambulances up. Wow. Which was very good service. Wow. wow. You know, one was a lady who was um, a little indiscreet in my viewpoint, about six months along she was, and she ate a big heavy meal and then finished it off with something to chill the food. I forget it was ice cream or some kind of thing. Anyway, it was just too much overload. And I have a theory in, in pregnancy that a woman's body says, I'm growing a baby, that takes a lot of work. Yeah. And if you give me a heavy meal to digest at the same time, I have to pick which I'm going to do because I can't do both very well. So if she eats a really heavy, hard to digest meal late at night when her body's tired, mm -hmm. that can precipitate premature labor. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened in this case. And she went into mm -hmm. labor and delivered these babies way early. But since mm -hmm. we knew we should in labor, we did call and they got a crew and, and babies made it. I think that one went to um, North Dakota, if I recall, but one of them anyway. But uh, anyway, they, they did survive, but it's too bad in my view that she hadn't been more aware of how she could have Kept them, yeah, nutrition yeah. and just the way that you eat yep. makes all the difference. Mm -hmm. I think it's time to go to wow. a break, but when we get back, let's talk about that some more. That's a great topic. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. We'll be back in a minute. Well, that's the first half of today's More About Birth episode with the Mandals. It's good to have them back. We will be back with more with the Mandals after the break. This podcast is intended for educational purposes only. Please visit Natural Care Midwifery and our podcast page for our full disclosure. This podcast is intended for educational purposes only. Please visit Natural Care Midwifery and our podcast page for our full disclosure. Well, welcome back to the second half of today's part two episode with Dr. Mundal and his wife and Angie Henson. You are going to lead the ship here in the second half, so take it away. All right, so I think you guys have a couple more stories for us. I really want to hear about um, how you dealt with the eruptions that you encountered and maybe the food allergy story, because I thought that one was fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long time ago, but to, uh, one week, in one week, he had two abrupt placentas uh, women, and there was he could not do a fast C-section. And thankfully to God, he pulled both the babies out, saved both mothers, and he never lost a baby that was alive when the mother went in labor or a mother. And I think that is the blessing of God. And we're just oh, thankful yes. for that. This was in the hospital. That, that was happened. in the hospital that that happened. Mm -hmm. Both of those were in the hospital. Mm -hmm. But still, all you could do is deliver the baby. He's 25 minutes away from doing a fast right. C-section right. somewhere mm -hmm. else. So, yeah. you know, God blesses when you are out by yourself. You do the best you can. Now, when you say pulled the baby out, I mean, what, what does that yeah, mean? Explain like, this. How well, far are these babies <laughs> along and, you know... Just like from a midwife medical standpoint, like what did that look like? What did you do? She wants the details. What did you do with your hands? Like <laughs> how did you do, how did you accomplish this? Did you literally pull them out? Well, what what you need, of course, if you have a head in the 
uh, birth canal and it's uh, blotting the uh, cervix, then mm -hmm. you can't bleed much from that, but you can still bleed mm -hmm. behind the baby. Right. And so that's what happened with the one is it didn't really have much awareness until all of a sudden the baby's head delivers. And then when you get more space, all of a sudden the blood starts mm -hmm. gushing out and you realize, oh, that's what was going on. Mm -hmm. So at that point, then you just have to uh, deal with the baby and make sure it's... So you literally reached up there. Did you reach up under mm -hmm. the arm? Fortunately, I have you? small hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And uh, I'm familiar with the Marisol manure if I need it for breaches. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I learned a couple of... Heard of a couple of tricks I've never had to use, but I was prepared any time if there was ever... In my internship, there was once a baby that was a diabetic mother, and the baby was probably, I forget, 12 pounds or whatever. It was a huge baby. A little and one, yeah. And <laughs> basically, they got the head delivered and couldn't deliver right. around that, and that baby died. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was not the delivering doctor. I was mm -hmm. just, you know, an intern, and this was another resident doing the delivery. Wow. But, I, you know, I wanted to learn how, how would I ever prevent that right. if it were my delivery. And so I learned about... You know, reaching your finger in and snapping the clavicle mm -hmm. and making the shoulder smaller so you can get the shoulders out. So mm. I never fortunately had to use that maneuver I for know, shoulder dystocia, but do I, I had it in mind. The other one that I learned yeah. about and I fortunately never had to use, I heard it came from uh, midwives in Africa. And you have to have the right equipment and the right knowledge. Unfortunately, I never had to do it there. But there's they have a, a little almost like a utility knife, but a certain blade, a certain length. And you... If you've got a dystocia where you just can't deliver that baby uh -huh. and there's no chance for a C-section, you take the knife and you just cut the symphysis pubis. Just separate it. Just yeah. separate it. I've heard about that. Yeah. And uh, then you can deliver the baby. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe not be the most wonderful way to do it, but it's better to have mm -hmm. a live baby than not. And the women that have had that done, even though the mm -hmm. pubic bones stay apart afterwards, usually you could sew them back together, but no, usually it's not done. Mm -hmm. They say there's no real problem. They don't have any difficulty Isn't with that the interesting. afterwards. It's not a big, Well, I think wow. some pubic bones actually separate on their own. Sometimes the ligaments are soft labor. enough. During mm -hmm. labor, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear about this um, allergy story. Yeah, allergy that was an just... interesting lady. She already knew, of course, she had allergies. She had a lot of hay fever and so forth. And in that time frame, I had learned about a blood test you can do that measures the levels of the uh, antibodies in the bloodstream towards mm -hmm. the proteins from certain foods. Yeah, back in that day, it was called... Um, um, the N95? RAS testing, radioallergic uh -huh. absorbent procedure. Now it's called ELISA testing because it uses enzyme-linked... Uh -huh. uh, immunoassay. But uh, anyway, I had had that test available. This lady had a lot of allergies. When she first came to me, she must have been, I think, second or third month of her pregnancy. We did that blood test, sent it off to the lab, got back the results when she was four months along. When she came in that time and I measured her, her uterus was seven months size. Wow. At four months. And you'd probably so think twins, You'd right? think twins the first yeah. thing you want to think of. And I listened and listened and couldn't find a second heartbeat. Uh -huh. And I was usually pretty adept at that. Uh, if there were two, I, I could yeah. usually feel the fetal parts or, or find that second heartbeat. And I couldn't. So uh, anyway, she started on the diet right at that point. We found out which food she was allergic to. She stopped eating those foods. She came back a month later, five months. Uterus was five months size. Wow. Do you wow. think it was excess fluid? So yes, I, I recognize then this was a case of polyhydramnios. Yeah. There's just all kinds of amniotic fluid in there. And mm. uh, that's one of the consequences of immune system reactivity. When we have allergies, that's why people get more congestion in their uh -huh. sinuses or wherever else, make more swelling. I never thought to relate it. So to it causes swelling in the amniotic fluid. And uh, so as, as I've said many times, every one of my patients is one of my professors. I learned from everyone. And she taught me how important that's true, the isn't it? Is. Yeah. I feel like I've learned and learned and learned, but the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. Yeah. The more yeah. I need yeah. to learn. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's that a, is. infinity beyond. There's always something yeah. new. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so which allergy amazing. test are you using currently? The one I was using at that time, I'm not sure if it was immuno lab. It wasn't immuno lab in Florida. I think there was one in Kansas City, but uh the oh, so you're sending them off. I it's send not them off. Local. I don't have it. I can't do it in my own lab. No, and the lab, standard laboratories don't do that kind of testing. Right. It's got to be a specialty lab. The one I've used most in, in this region is U.S. Biotech. It's in Seattle. Mm -hmm. And they do a good job and for quite a reasonable price. There are labs back in Florida that sometimes charge as much as 10 times as higher price. Okay. Wow. So I'll have to get that information from you later. Wow. But yeah. this is probably a good time to talk about how you even know these great people and where they're located and... Yeah. Um, 
Well, I, you know, that's a whole other story unto itself as far as how they got to Connell. Five and, minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, and you know, the practice that, um, that's there. But um, we actually found these guys about 10 years ago. Um, I had had a good experience previously with an integrative medicine doctor. And so I um, had looked up a doctor in the Tri-Cities area that way and found them and were so, so thankful that we did because um, it's just been an incredible experience. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about the clinic and about the Mundals and about their practice. And um, yeah, it's just very unique, very personal, very um, old school in the good sense of um, the personal relationship and the willingness to go above and beyond for people is just incredible. So um, yeah, tell us a little bit about your current practice and what it looks like in your specialty and what you're doing these days. Well, over time, uh, when I was in medical school, I sort of made a vow to myself and my future patients. And I said, I'm going to pursue truth about health the rest of my career. And I really don't care where I end up, yeah. which is a pretty bold idea mm. to have. And this is where I've ended up. And I've, it's been a long winding pathway and it wasn't too long until I was diverging from what I had been taught. Mm. I uh, learned in medical school about different tests that some people did, including this blood test for allergies, and I was told that it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. So I had that bias to overcome to ever start doing that mm -hmm. kind of testing. Another test I heard about was a test for checking the minerals in a person's body, both good and bad. What's their calcium level and their lead level or their cadmium level, whatever. Right using tissue instead of using blood. Turns out that many minerals don't have very uh, adequate levels in the bloodstream. They're not water soluble and so they don't travel, they don't stay there, they let travel the tissue. So there's a test back in that era that I used a lot and still use some uh, and uses a sample of scalp hair. Mm -hmm. And we can measure the minerals with that and get some idea of whether the body has a deficiency in say a trace mineral like manganese or boron, or whether there's an excessive body burden of lead or cadmium or aluminum or whatever. So I was also told that test in medical school was not anything to be desired and it was a waste of You're just money. a rebel. <laughs> yeah. Probably a little bit of that somewhere. <laughs> so anyway, when I got out into practice, especially in Minnesota, I, I had my knowledge that I had gained in medical school. I said, I'll try to by the book. So I did just the way it worked. I was supposed to do it. Didn't work for some patients. Yeah. I did what was right and it didn't end up any help. I said, okay, if I did already the things I'm supposed to do, use the drugs I'm supposed to or whatever else I was supposed to do, and it didn't work, then what have I got to lose by looking some yeah. other directions and finding some more answers? So I started doing that and lo and behold, I found answers and it was really interesting to me. I recall one case was when I was mm -hmm. practicing in Western Nebraska, a lady came in and she was feeling sick, headaches and dizziness and fatigue and so forth. I did a hair sample, sent her to the lab, came back. She had an excessive body burden of arsenic. Oh. And so when she came back for the visit, I said, well, you're arsenic loaded. She says, yeah, I figured it was some toxin. She says, uh, we were living at a certain farm and I was getting sick there and we already moved to another farm and I'm already starting to feel better. So apparently it was in the water in that wow. well wow. at that farm. But without doing that test of a hair sample, I would have never had a clue as to right. why she had been sick. Do you do saliva testing at all? I do some saliva testing. Mm -hmm. Mostly nowadays for, for hormones in some cases and things like that. So what would you say is your specialty if someone were to say, go to Dr. Mandal because he's just really honed in in this particular area? Well, it's... I, I can't, it's hard to use a single word, although integrated mm -hmm. medicine comes pretty close, I suppose, or, or whatever. But uh, I fortunately, early in my career, took a couple classes from Jonathan Wright and Alan Gaby. And they had a class they called Nutritional Medicine. Mm -hmm. And I took that course. It was a couple, several day course. And they would go through every nutrient and say, okay, this is what it does. This is what you feel like if you don't have enough is what you have. You get too much or whatever. Uh -huh. Then they'd go through every disease and say, from the medical literature, what did that disease would respond to in terms of nutrition? So it was quite a complete thing. And obviously mm -hmm. nutrition doesn't fix everything, but it does work with the many conditions. So I often I do concern myself a nutritional MD. But as I got more into that, I realized there's multiple areas of health that are being affected by our modern society with the environment that we live right. in, and especially toxins is a very important one mm -hmm. because of all the pesticides and heavy metals and things that are right. out there. So uh, uh, I took classes on how to get rid of toxic metals and so forth from the human body. And the main process we use there is called chelation therapy. So I learned about that and began utilizing that. And so 
Uh, that area I call clinical toxicology. We're looking for what's poisoning the body mm -hmm. and trying to clear that out. And then the nutritional medicine, you find what uh, the body doesn't have enough of and correct that. And then the third area is the immune system. If our immune system is fighting the wrong things or not fighting hard enough, then that creates problems. And that's what the food allergies come into it. So those are the three main areas that I practice in clinical toxicology, nutritional medicine, and immunology or food allergies. So when someone comes into you um, just for a general problem, mm -hmm. you look at the whole picture. Absolutely. You don't yeah. just say, okay, here's a prescription for whatever symptom you're having. No, if they're looking for that, I will try to oblige them, but I'll try to educate them <laughs> that there's far better ways to take care of their health. Uh, yeah. And uh, my usually my first visit, I spend an hour or more. I want to get awesome. the whole ball of wax, everything that's happened in their entire lifetime that's relevant to their health and try to address everything. Because to, I find, to me, it's a game, almost like a, a puzzle, you know, a hundred piece puzzle, whatever. Uh, when they tell me every little symptom they've had and this and that and the other throughout their lifespan, I want to put all those pieces on the table and see how they fit together and what picture they make. So the more data points I can have, yeah. the better I can yeah. just determine what's going on with them. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I think one of the things that we've so appreciated <coughs> about the practice also is just because of having your own children and raising seven kids together and, um, a whole slew of grandkids now, how many? 15. Okay. Ooh, yeah. Um, and, fun. and, you know, having a family practice for so many, um, years of your life, I think just the, the knowledge from, you know, infant to adult and on right, through life has right. just been, um, so wonderful to have that wealth of knowledge and not have to go to a pediatrician or not have to go, you know, to these different specialists for it's our kids and practice. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not like just a vague, like broad family practice. It's like, you know, the knowledge for the kids and the babies. Envisioning is still Marcus Welby, MD. I don't know if you guys ever watched that show back in the day. He was just a hometown doctor that mm -hmm. saw the whole family and was yeah. personally involved in their lives. Yeah. yeah. Great. Yeah. So I think we're going to have to wrap this podcast up. We're going to yeah. have to have these guys back again. This is too much fun. Yeah. I just want to say, um, I hope that we can have them back sometime. And I hope that y'all tune in for that because yeah. we really want to touch on some hot topics, um, thyroid problems, thyroid and pregnancy yep. specifically, um, some infertility issues. I know they have some really amazing, um, infertility success stories. So we'd love to hear from about those. Um, and lots of more, you know, tips of, from things that cross over from that toxicology and nutrition yes. into pregnancy and how it affects those things. So we are out of time, but, um, I hope that we can touch on those things in the future because they're, they're really great. Mm -hmm. So we thank you guys so, thank much, you so much for being oh, here yeah. and You're sharing welcome. with us your life and your wisdom. And I hope we can do it again sometime. Yeah. It was a tease. I want more. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's it with today's part two episode with Dr. Mandal and his wife. Amazing stories. We've learned a lot together and um, we hope to have you back again very soon. So thank you for joining us on More About Birth. We'll see you soon. See you later. This podcast is intended for educational purposes only. Please visit Natural Care Midwifery and our podcast page for our full disclosure.